Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin, and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. Will, um, take your Bibles, and uh, if you have one, and turn with me to, um, to Hebrews uh, chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 25 through 29 before uh, Joey gets started in, in leading us through the Word. So, All right, let's read together. Um, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those who did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn, uh, much less will uh, we escape who turn away from him who warms, warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth and then, then but, has, uh, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. Um, God, I praise you, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time to be together with my family, dear Lord. Um, God, I thank you that um, by your work that you have um, redeemed me and my brothers and sisters, and that, God, you have, making, uh, you have made us part of your kingdom, dear Lord. Um, and God, that, that we know that um, one day all things will be restored uh, to you. Um, God, that the, the sin that, that we still struggle with, even though that you have forgiven us of that and you have made us right with you, that, uh, that one day um, all of that will be completely gone and we will just be able to, um, to stand in your presence and worship you completely and wholly, dear Lord. And I thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we are coming to the end of Hebrews, and believe it or not, uh, even though we've been here for 10 months now, this is the 10th month, the writer says in chapter 13 that I have written to you briefly. Uh, so, <laughs> not so brief, uh, but once we roll into 13, I'll get to preach topically, and we'll get to deal with a few subjects along the way. But he's closing out his remarks for 12 chapters. He has laid out this argument or this discourse, if you will. And it's interesting. There's a couple of points here that I want to point out as we come to the conclusion of that. First point that I want to make is he ends right where he began. Look at verse 25 with me if you have your Bibles. And let me see if I have it up there. No, that's okay. We'll get to this in a minute. Look at 1225. And look what the writer says. He says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is present tense speaking. Do not refuse God who is even today speaking to us. Now keep your hand there and go back to Hebrews chapter 1 and look at verse 1. This is how we began back in January with this thought. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. That's his main point through all of this, that God is continually speaking to us about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go back to chapter 12 and look at verse 24 just above that. He says, you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks. And so this writer wants us to see that God is continually extending grace to us, helping us to see and to realize 
that He is speaking to us, calling us to a life of faith that we can endure only in Christ alone. Come to God through Christ. He speaks even now. Now, what is interesting about that is the way he concludes this whole thought. Because look at verses 28 and 29. Chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. We'll have you in a couple of different places this morning. Look what he says there. Therefore, since we, that's us, receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. In other words, we're receiving a kingdom that is eternal. Let us show gratitude, or grace is the word. Let us show thanksgiving by, and I'm not particularly fond of the way the NAS translates this. The next word after by is worship or service. By worship that is pleasing or acceptable to God. Let us show thanks because we're receiving an eternal kingdom. How do we show thanks to God? By worship or serve. It's the same word. Put both of them in there and think about them both. By worshiping God or serving God in a particular way. Pleasing to Him. You mean you can worship God in a way that's not pleasing? Absolutely. He wants worship that is acceptable and pleasing. And then He gives us with an attitude. We've got to have the right attitude. You can do all the right motions and have a wrong attitude. The attitude that he wants us to have when we come to worship is one of reverence and awe. Those two words are also translated caution and fear. How many times have I, how many times have you come together to worship God without reverence and awe? When you think about those words, particularly in the context of being cautious and fearful, and you think about modern day worship services today with all that goes on, they're jokey, they're flippant, they're arrogant, they're entertaining. They have nothing to do with being pleasing to God that we come together in caution and in fear and reverence and awe because we are standing before an awesome God. Look at verse 29. Look at this thought. For our God is a consuming fire. Why are you saying that? That does not sound like a New Testament statement. If I was going to conclude my whole letter, 12 chapters of an argument, I would wind up with God is love. God is gracious, God is kind, God is merciful, right? The writer of Hebrews says, no, our God is a consuming fire. That's why he comes from the thought, you better come to worship. You better go to serve with this attitude of having a reverent and awe-filled heart in regard to your God. It makes us take things a little more seriously, don't it? When I get up here, I intentionally try to shift gears. If you've ever been around me away from here, I'm not a serious person. My kids will tell you, you can't take anything he says seriously. It's just the way I like it. But when I get up here, I'm afraid. Paul says that I preach with fear and trembling when I get up there. It's the realization that we have intentionally called to God and said, give us your ear. We want to engage you in worship. And beloved, if we're going to come before a God that is awesome and holy and the Bible describes as a consuming fire, let's not be jokey and flippant and arrogant. Let's be awestruck and sincere and worship Him in that way. What the writer is doing here is quoting an Old Testament passage from Deuteronomy. You don't have to turn there now. I'll have you go there later. But in, in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 4, it's an unusual situation. Moses is standing at the edge of the promised land and he's standing there with all the children. They've been in the desert for 40 years. Mom and dad have died. 
Now, if you remember, mom and dad were the ones that were so afraid. God's brought us out here to die. Our children are going to die. Huh. And yet, they're all alive. Every one of those kids are standing at the door of the promised land. Mom and dad have perished in the wilderness over the 40 year period. And Moses in the book of Deuteronomy is his last will and testament. He can't go into the promised land because he's defied or offended the holiness of God. And if we have time, I'll show you that later. So he's standing there and he's going, I can't go with you. But I know and you know what you do when I'm not here. You always fall into sin. So the book of Deuteronomy is this long sermon that's a warning to all of them. And he begins with this thought in 4.1. He says, Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments. In other words, listen to the word of God. I am teaching you so that three things. You'll know how to live. You'll know how to go in. And you'll know how to take possession of the promised land. Listen to the word so that you'll know how to live. Here's the thought. I bought you. You're mine. And now you're going to live like I tell you to live. And for the last 40 years, you never have. And your shepherd's leaving you, and you better live like God's telling you to live. And then he says to them very briefly, or shortly after that, he says, watch yourselves. Don't forget the Word of God. And then he comes to this thought. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. That's Moses' last thought. I mean, you can imagine somebody laying on their deathbed and God's already told them, hey, I'm about to take you up on this mountain and you're going to die. You better speak your peace to your people. And so that's what he's doing. And he ends with that thought. God is a consuming fire. The writer of Hebrews gets to the end of his in the New Testament. We're thinking this doesn't fit, right? Old Testament, New Testament, we should hear something different. No, he's the same God. The writer of Hebrews comes to this last thought. God is a consuming fire. Now, I told you we love to define God, don't we? And we have a tendency to choose those terms that we are more comfortable with. And they're not not true. They're very true. God is very loving. If I was going to pick one, I'd pick, I'd pick that one. He, he is gracious. He is absolutely merciful and kind. But on the same token, He is full of wrath and indignation. Four times in the Bible He says He hates sinners. You say, I thought He hated the sin and loved the sinner. No, that's not in the Bible. The Bible says He hates sinners. There is a side of God that is filled with wrath and indignation. The writer of Hebrews leans toward these, and we've looked at these, but let's, let's go through them very quickly again. In Hebrews 2, the writer warns us, who I've often credited with Paul, but it's not Paul, y'all. It's just out of habit, okay? Don't know who wrote it. But in Hebrews 2, he says, We must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so that we don't drift away from it. And then he says in verse 3, How will we escape? Escape who? God? How are you going to escape God if you neglect His salvation? That's strong language. Look at chapter 3, verse 12. Again, I have it up here for you. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any single one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. And when we see living God, it's a warning. Just to remind you, He's still alive. He's still judged. You ought to approach Him with reverence and awe. Look at chapter 10. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sins. Look how he describes God. But a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume. This again, this is in the New Testament. Look at 1030. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. One more I left out in Hebrews 12, 25 before we conclude with His last thought. 
1225, he says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns us from heaven? And then he concludes, For our God is a consuming fire. Terrifying thought. If you got your notes, I don't want to run off and leave you. Let me get one so I'll make myself follow along. God is, we are, God has, we should. First thought, God is a consuming fire. We don't ever need to forget that. We greatly underestimate, do not remotely understand the awesomeness and the holiness of our God. We haven't a clue. We've made him fun and jokey again and our buddy and this guy that's with me all the time that just is constantly doing things for me. No, that's not him. He is awesome and he is holy. And if you ever stand before his presence, and you one day will, you will have the same response that Isaiah had and John had in Revelations. You will fall down and wish you were dead. Because he is awesome. When I thought about this passage and his holiness, I want you to go here with me. Turn to Leviticus chapter 10. Third book of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Turn to chapter 10. This is a terrifying story. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1. There are two sons here. They're the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. Took their respective fire pans, not the one that God said they ought to use. And putting fire in them, not the fire that God had provided, their own. They placed incense on it. God didn't tell them to do that. And offered strange fire. You see that word offered? They're in the temple worshiping God. They're not out, quote unquote, sinning. They're not living an immoral lifestyle. They're not doing something ignorant or ungodly. They come before God in worship. God looks upon it as strange fire because he had not commanded them. Look at his response in verse 2. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Look at verse 3. Moses said to Aaron. Now what would you expect Moses to say to Aaron in that moment? I'm so sorry about your sons. This is a horrible tragedy. Look at what Moses says. It's what the Lord said. By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron kept silent. Get the gravity of that scene. Those are my sons walking in to worship God. Except they walk in flippantly, carelessly, ignoring the word of God. And how he told them specifically how they were to come before him and worship and in a moment, God consumes them. And Moses looks at Aaron and says, You know what God said? You better treat him as holy. It's the same God in the New Testament. You do understand. He's the same way. He's never changed. Malachi 3 says, I, the Lord, do not change. And when we get to Hebrews 13, he says, Jesus has never changed. He's the same God. He's the same holy God. And you say, how can we ever come before him? You can't. It's not possible. Let me give you just a little bit of relief in this moment that I'll get to later, but I'll give you one breath. This is just how perfectly Jesus met the requirements of God. Everything, every I was dotted, every T was crossed. It was perfection in His actions, 
in his words, in his thoughts, in his desires. When Christ went before God on our behalf, everything was beautiful and perfect and acceptable. If he hadn't done that, beloved, we would never, ever stand before God. We could not. We would be absolutely consumed. And you say, but what if I didn't know? It doesn't matter. That doesn't change His holiness. He's absolutely, beautifully, wonderfully, perfect in every way. And it's amazing to me that He ever invites us into His presence. But He does. So that's who He is. In fact... It's even more frightening when you listen to Peter's word in chapter one. Uh, listen to what Peter says. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in church. Doesn't say that. Be holy yourselves in all your behavior. You mean not just in here when I'm worshiping God? Beloved, you're worshiping God 24-7, whether you realize it or not. You worship God while you're at work. It's an offering to God. Peter tells us you need to be holy in all your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. You see where the reverence and awe comes from? This is not silly time. This is deeply serious. This is how we ought to be as the people of God and how we should come in and worship God together. He's awesome. And it's, it's a travesty when I think about Nadab and Abihu. They went to worship God and then I think about how I've come in to worship God before. I'm going to have to apologize to them. Because if it had not been for Christ... I'd have been barbecued a long time ago, even as a preacher. But that's everything that Christ has accomplished for us. So that's who he is. Let's look at who we are. We, not only do we miss out on his holiness, but we greatly underestimate, do not remotely understand our sinfulness. We are so horribly depraved. Look at, you're in Genesis, well, you may be in Leviticus. Go back to Hebrews. Genesis. Go back to Hebrews chapter 12. The writer of Hebrews paints this wonderful contrast for us. He's got two mountains in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 18. He's got Mount Sinai, Old Testament. God shows up and reveals himself. He's got Mount Zion, where God shows up and reveals himself in the person of Christ. So you have one setting on Sinai, which is deeply horrifying, terrifying, scary for a particular reason. And then you have the one on Zion that is beautiful and wonderful and gracious and merciful. And that's Jesus. But I want you to see what God is doing, because, you know, in both mountains, you know what he's trying to bring about in his people? Holiness. He just does it in two different ways because he wants to teach us something. Look at Hebrews 12. Look at verse 18. He says, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness, gloom, and whirlwind. We haven't come to that, but they did. They came to a blazing fire. They came to darkness, gloom, and whirlwind. They came to the blast of a trumpet in verse 19. And the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even an animal touches the mountain, it will be stoned. So terrible was the sight that Moses says, I am full of fear and trembling. Let's go back and look at that mountain. Go back to Exodus chapter 19. Second book of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus. I want you to see this whole picture, Exodus 19. As you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background. We're going through this on Wednesday night. So my Wednesday night people have just got this like this. God calls them out of Egypt, okay? He calls them out of chaos and slavery of 400 years. He immediately brings them to Mount Sinai and He immediately reveals Himself because like I said earlier, he wants to teach them this. I bought you. 
Now I'm going to teach you how to behave. You used to live in chaos and sin. Now you're going to walk in order and holiness. So they spend one year at Mount Sinai with God teaching them how they're going to be the people of God. Okay? Now look at where he first shows up. Look at verse 18. Exodus 19, verse 18. Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, and you can imagine these angels blowing these trumpets and it just gets so loud. Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. Now, get this picture. You're standing at the foot of the mountain and the whole thing's shaking. That's not a pleasant place to stand. The whole top of it is continually burning. Smoke plumes are flying off of that. Lightning is popping all around you and it's thundering. And those angels, which to me would have been the worst part, because you know when something keeps getting louder and louder and louder and you feel like you're about to have a nervous breakdown if it doesn't hush, that's the air experience with God. I want to show you the first words of God because that's the most important word. You can imagine in that moment and then God speaks. Look at 20 verse 1. Then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And look at his first word to them. You shall have no other gods before me. You can imagine the moment. You're hanging on the first word. No other gods. Look at their response down in 2018. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when they saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. And then they said to Moses, speak to us yourselves and we'll listen. But don't let God speak to us or we'll die. That's how terrified they were. We just can't take this. I'm surprised in the text. I even made sure, but it actually does say they trembled and stood. I can't, can't believe they stood. And here's why. The most afraid I've ever been, and if I've told you this story twice, I'm old enough to do that, so y'all just act like you've never heard it. The most afraid I've ever been was, y'all remember the earthquake that we had? I don't remember what year that was. But we were in the back bedroom at that time, Paige and I were, the kids were babies, and we woke up, and I heard that sound, and it kept getting a little louder and a little louder, and then I heard my window start doing that. And then I woke Paige up, and by the time I woke Paige up, the bed was, we could feel it in the bed moving. Didn't know what it was, and I always assumed that I did something wrong, so my first thought was, somehow I left the gas on, and things are going in super slow motion so I can save my family because it's about to explode. The whole house is going to go up. That was really what I was thinking. I jumped out of bed, and when my feet hit the ground, my knees didn't work. I couldn't walk. They were just had turned to water. I'd never been that afraid before in my whole life. And I had to stop and grab the dresser and get a hold of myself because I couldn't walk. My legs were like this. I felt so ignorant, but that's how afraid I was. And I got my legs under me and I grabbed all my kids up and we went out in the front yard. I don't know what that was going to help, but I really thought the house was about to blow up. So I'm standing out in the kids in the middle of the night and it stops and I still don't know what it was. I never, I'll never forget that. Never forget that feeling. And I see people that way, you know, and they're out of getting a car wreck or something. They're so afraid and that you just have to help them to the ground because they have no more strength in their legs. They just can't go. You remember that. Do you realize how horrifying it would have been to stand at the foot of this mountain and all this is going on and then God says in thunder, do not have any more gods. I'm it. There was a purpose in all that. Look at 2020. This is why he did this. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you 
and in order, look, that the fear of him might remain in you so that you may not, what? Sin. I'm good. I'm done with sin. Please stop, God. There's no way you're going to forget that. I'll never sin again. That was the whole purpose of the, all that awesome display of absolute destruction and annihilation. It's about sin and holiness. You're my people. Be holy. I'm going to scare the bejibbers out of you so you'll never sin. Did it work? For 40 days like a charm. You know what their first words were on 41 days? Listen to this. Come, let us make a God. Now the Bible says the fire was still going. I don't know about the thunder and the lightning and all that. You can assume that. There's no problem with that. But the text says the fire was still burning. And the first words that they speak is the very first word that God said to them, don't do. And they turned and did it. God is awesome and holy. He's a consuming fire. We are huh, infinitely depraved and sinful. You know what the purpose of all that was? God was teaching us something. That's what I said earlier. What is He teaching us? You and I are absolutely incapable of meeting the righteous requirements of God. Can't do it. The very smallest thing that God requires of me, I am so stinking rebellious, you give me half a chance and I'll do it. That's who you are. That's who I am. That's how I treat God. We are sinful. Now, God has. Beloved, He's done so much. If you're not in Hebrews, make your way back to Hebrews. Chapter 10. So, here's the thoughts. God is infinitely holy. We are infinitely depraved. In order for us to be in the presence of God and not insult His holiness and thereby be consumed, we must be made what? Holy. We have to be just like Him. Look at 1014. For by one offering, that was the cross, He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Now, if you don't care or not, perfect is in the perfect tense, which means once for all. And if you missed that, He went ahead and wrote it in the language. Once for all. In Christ... You have been positionally, is the theological term, positionally made holy. When God looks at you, if you're in Christ, you are absolutely, perfectly, in every way, holy. You say, good, that's me. Well, hang on. We got two more. And those two are the measure of the first one. You don't get to call that shot, okay? Let's let him call it. But the first thing you need to realize is, Everything that had to be made possible for you so that you could worship God like Nadab and Abihu have been taken care of. I can't do anything wrong. I have unlimited access to a holy God simply because in Christ I'm holy. It's ridiculous. What we get is absurd what we have in Christ. And sometimes we're still flippant, right? But not only do we get positional holiness, we get something on top of that. Look with me at, I think I just got ahead of myself. Look with me at chapter 10, verses 15 through 16. So we get the positional holiness from the cross. Look what else we get. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I'll make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law upon their heart 
and on their mind I will write them. And then he says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Go back to Exodus or Deuteronomy. I gave you my word so you'll know how to live. Go back to Exodus 19. My first word to you, apart from the cross and the Holy Spirit, will be rebellion for you because you'll turn from it. But now, beloved, God has taken that word and He didn't tell your ears. He wrote it on your heart. So instead of saying, come, let us make a God, do you know what you can do through the sacrifice of, the cry of Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit? You can now say, come, let us go to God, for Christ has made a way. You see, not only do you have positional holiness, you have a new passion for holiness. You love holiness if you've been made holy. I saw this in my daughter's life yesterday. Abby is at Plainview, and we had to sit out a year because she's in eighth grade. She's playing volleyball. So she can't play the games or the, the county games or the area games, but she's got to play a few of those that don't count. But she calls the line. She's the girl standing at the back corner calling the line, and she has to call it for her own team. Okay? So they got put out of the county tournament yesterday, but she's back there calling the line, and a girl hits a ball uh, for the other team, and it hits, you know, if it hits the line, it's in, right? It hit the back edge of the back line. I mean, it was so close, but it hit the back edge of the back line. Abby calls it against her team. Points at the ground, said it hit the line. Her whole team fusses on her. What are you doing? Could have easily called that out. It hit the line. She got in the car, and you know what she said? Dad, I wouldn't lie for nothing. That's a desire that doesn't come from the flesh. That's a desire to want to do right and to be holy in every behavior that we have. It comes from God. And it's confirmation for us that I have positional holiness because now I have a new passion that overrides my desire to win. I wasn't there at her age. I wanted to win. She wants to be right. She's got something I didn't have at that age. It's a passion for holiness. There's one more thing that he does, though. Not only do we get positional holiness, not only do we get passion for holiness, but look at chapter 12, verse 7. I'm going to read 7, then drop down to 10 in Hebrews 12. It said, It is for discipline that you endure. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? They, our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as they seem best. But God disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his what? Holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Watch this. You've got positional holiness. How do I know that? How do I know that? Well, you've got a passion for holiness. How do I know I have a passion for holiness? You're pursuing holiness. You see, if you're pursuing holiness, then you have a passion for holiness. And if you have a passion for holiness, you have a position of holiness that God has given you through the sacrifice of Christ. Remember what we said? All the circumstances and, and difficulties in life, and Chris shared with me some friends of theirs that lost an infant this weekend. God can redeem that. God can use those circumstances and create a holiness effect in their life through such horrible circumstances as living, losing a precious child. God is that sovereign. And if you're His child, everything gets redeemed. Everything becomes training. The most sorrowful, horrible moments becomes glory in God's eyes because He says, I'll use that to help you pursue holiness. 
there's no other option for you if you're a child of God. He makes you pursue holiness. And sometimes He has to really get our attention, don't He? God's doing all this on our behalf. This is not a Mount Sinai. This is a Mount Zion. What I told you to pursue through obedience, now I give you through the cross. What I told your ears, now I write it on your heart. And I take all your circumstances and I weave all of that into doing what I am doing. What's God up to here? What's the deal? You remember in 4.1 I told you Moses' last words. He says, now listen to me. I'm going to teach you the word so that you'll know how to live, how to go in, and how to take possession of this land I'm giving you. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom, it's not a land. What's the purpose of all this holiness? Why am I getting positional holiness? Why am I getting a passion for holiness? Why is God causing me to pursue holiness? Because He's preparing me for a kingdom. In the text it says we receive a kingdom, present tense, which means you are currently receiving the kingdom of God. He has prepared a place for His people and now He is pre preparing His people for that place. So then the question of my sermon title, how then shall we live now? Like we will live then. We're called to live exactly like we're going to live in the kingdom. Remember Jesus' very first words when He shows up in the Gospels? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn from your sin and yourself and start pursuing the righteousness of Christ. Here comes the kingdom. You remember how He taught us to pray? You do this for every ballgame. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where has God's kingdom come on earth? You're sitting there. The church. Where is God's will accomplished on earth? You're sitting there. It's the church. I love this word. Someone has said that we are the eschatological outpost of heaven. Let me give you a term that you might understand a little better. You know all these mega churches? They have satellites. We're the satellite of the kingdom. God's doing all this holiness in all of our lives. So when somebody says, I wonder what the kingdom of God will be like, you can honestly say, come to Corinth Baptist Church. Someone can say, what would it be like to see the will of God accomplished day by day? Come to Corinth Baptist Church. What's it going to be like? How will the people, how will we engage one another? What, what's our relationships going to be like in the kingdom of God? Come to Corinth Baptist Church. We are literally God's kingdom on earth. That's why this is so important to Him. That we go ahead and live now like we're going to live then. We are His outpost. We are His example. We are His satellite. When you go back with all these thoughts, and I'll conclude with this thought. You say, how, how in the world do we do that? We've already been through it. <clears throat> How do you do that as an individual? How do you live in the kingdom of God right now as an individual? Lay aside every weight that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance or endurance the race marked out for you. That's kingdom living. I'm going to throw away everything that doesn't count and I'm going to take the sin in my life and I'm going to get brutal about it and I'm going to beat that sin right out of my life and then by faith I'm going to endure and trust Christ. That's what you need to do as an individual. What do we do as a corporate body? Well, he tells us in 1215, 
See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Remember what I said last week? That's where we get involved in each other's lives and we come alongside of one another and go, Hey, brother, your life's not looking like the kingdom right now. And you're saying, I can't sign up for that one. That one's hard. Well, look at chapter 13, verse 1. Let love of the brethren continue. That word love there is not the agapao, what we normally have in Scripture. I think it's one of the only times he uses this word in Scripture. It's phileo, which is brotherly love. You know what that is? You know what brotherly love is? It's hanging out. It's getting along. It's sharing life. It's brotherly love. And if you're brotherly loving one another, then you can come along somebody and say, Brother, ugh, you're coming short of the grace of God here. Your life's not looking like a kingdom. I want to encourage you and I want to pray for you. You can do that. I've got the relationship with, I think, almost everybody in the church that I feel comfortable doing. I know that I can come along, almost all of you guys. If I said to Rob, Rob, the way you're dealing with your wife right now, brother is not reflecting the kingdom, I know him well enough to know that tears will well up in his eyes and one will run down his cheek and he will be broken, not mad. Because we have brotherly love. And he knows if I ever was bold enough to say something like that, he knows I said it because I love him. Until we do the personal things in our lives, and until we grow up and do the corporate things in our lives, we can't reflect the kingdom we're called to reflect. We have a job. And it's to reflect the glory of God. And it's not mystical, it's not magical, it's very practical. We've just got to walk in obedience to it. Let's pray.